Jennifer Raylene Casper was born on April 30, 1975, and raised in Pocatello, Idaho. She attended Highland High School and had dreamed of finding a cure for autism or cancer. After high school, she became a professional ballerina, but that career ended due to a tailbone injury. However, she didn't let her talent go to waste and began giving dance lessons. At the age of 20, she moved from Idaho to Reno, Nevada, and enrolled at Truckee Meadows Community College, where she was awarded the NASA National Space Grant College and Fellowship Program in 2000. She then transferred to the University of Nevada, and in 2001, she was inducted into the National Dean's List for maintaining a 3.9 grade point average. Her original major was veterinary medicine, but at some point switched to biomedical engineering. Unfortunately, things started going downhill for Jennifer over the next few years. By the age of 30, she and her husband, Sean Ross, were living in Reno with their three-year-old son, Isaac. She was deep in debt, and her credit cards were maxed out. Jennifer had been working as an exotic dancer, but was fired for unknown reasons. About a week after the firing, on May 4, 2005, sometime after 11 p.m., Jennifer left home and headed alone to the Pepper Mill Hotel and Casino. Sean advised her not to go because it was so late, but she went anyways. At 5.30 a.m. on the morning of May 5, 2005, she left the casino and took a cab to the Reno Sparks Cab Company on Gentry Way to visit her mother, Carla Casper Brown, who worked there. However, Jennifer was very intoxicated, and when she learned her mother wasn't working at the time, she strangely took off running. She exited the cab company and jumped a fence behind the building. She was about a mile from her house, but broke her high heels when she took off running, leaving her barefoot. After that, she was never seen again. A few minutes before she vanished, Jennifer called her father in Las Vegas and said she needed to come visit him, but after disappearing, she never showed up. According to Sean, the night she left for the casino, he had come home and found her drunk, with cuts on her wrist and saying she needed to leave. She had her clothes and family photos packed in a bag. Sean stated he initially tried to change her mind, but let her go after Jennifer insisted. After her disappearance, Sean found two bloodied notes inside their home. According to the police, the notes indicated Jennifer hoped Sean would continue to care for their son if anything ever happened to her and he should retain her possessions. Police have confirmed through DNA and handwriting analysis that Jennifer wrote the notes. A detective on the case said it remains unclear when the notes were written or under what circumstances. Sean reported Jennifer missing on May 10th, five days after he last saw her. Police say that at first, Jennifer's husband, Sean, cooperated with the investigation, but after failing a polygraph test, he never returned for a second interview. Jennifer's mother doesn't believe her daughter wrote the goodbye notes herself and stated that her daughter and Sean had often practiced each other's handwriting. According to Jennifer's mother, Sean lied numerous times to the media about Jennifer's case and also to the police. He gave numerous different stories about Jennifer, saying she suffered from postpartum depression, had gone missing before, had been fired from multiple jobs, and had affairs during the marriage, but she claims none of those things were true. In his initial statement to the police, Sean didn't mention the bag of belongings his wife supposedly had, the letters, or the cuts on her wrist, but those details were later added to his story. He told police Jennifer didn't have a dentist, which was untrue. She had only recently gotten her orthodontic braces removed, and Sean was aware she had regular dental care. Sean also sold Jennifer's van before the police could ever search it. Jennifer's mother said that Sean called her the night after at about 11 p.m. to inform her that her daughter was missing and he thought she was probably in a river. This was when her mother found out that Jennifer had come to her workplace the morning prior. She says after that, he changed his story. He also allegedly missed five days of work in a row after Jennifer disappeared and left their son in the care of a babysitter during that time. He filed for divorce three months after her disappearance and received full custody of their son. As of June 2023, Jennifer has never been found, and this case remains unsolved.
Melissa Ann Peasky was born in Akron, Iowa on July 31, 1978. In 2004, she married Ryan Peasky and the pair moved to Hartford, South Dakota. At the age of 40, Melissa was working as a realtor in Sioux Falls and enjoyed exploring old homes in her free time. Shortly before Christmas on December 13, 2018, Melissa decided to take her two children to a friend's home in South Carolina. Her husband, Ryan, was in the Air National Guard and had just returned from a tour in Afghanistan. Melissa and Ryan's marriage had been rocky for some time, and she had made plans to leave him. So she planned the trip to South Carolina because she felt that it was far enough away that she would be safe. Before leaving, her mother and sister helped her pack and noticed that Melissa seemed nervous about the trip. However, they had no idea this would be the last time they would ever see Melissa alive. As she was traveling through Boonville, Missouri on Interstate 70, she was on the phone with her sister, Kara. Melissa said it was raining really hard and there was a semi in the ditch, plus a car swerving all over the road. Melissa told her sister to hang on for a minute so she could go around the swerving car. She put the phone down for a few seconds and then picked it back up. At 10.23 p.m., which was about two or three minutes after resuming the conversation, Melissa would suddenly stop talking. Kara stayed on the line for a few minutes, yelling her sister's name, but she never heard her voice again or anything else for that matter. Witnesses said that as Melissa was driving east on Interstate 70, she appeared to lose control of her car around mile marker 96. Her car veered into the median and then crashed. Her two children, who were five and 11 at the time, were unhurt, but Melissa sadly didn't survive. Shockingly, an autopsy determined that she had been killed by a single gunshot wound fired from outside the vehicle. Since Kara never heard the gunshot or crash, could Melissa have muted her phone when she was shot? At first, investigators thought that her death was a tragic accident or a random act of violence. Eventually, however, they came to the conclusion that Melissa had been deliberately targeted. In the week following her murder, detectives received dozens of potential leads and followed up on more than 60 tips. Six years after the murder, one of Melissa's friends told reporters that Melissa had been afraid of her husband, Ryan, and had wanted to file for divorce in the weeks leading up to her murder. Ryan admitted to being a person of interest in the crime, but denied having anything to do with his wife's murder. However, an anonymous friend said that Melissa had asked Ryan for a divorce shortly before he was deployed to Afghanistan. Melissa said Ryan then threatened to kill her, and she wanted to make sure her friend went to the police if something ever happened to her. The friend went to law enforcement and child protective services, but nothing was done, and Ryan retained custody of his children. By February 2019, authorities had investigated 139 leads, but still weren't any closer to arresting a suspect. Melissa's two children also couldn't provide any useful information to detectives, as they had both been asleep at the time of the accident. Her mother, Ellen, and Melissa's sisters have said they aren't accusing Ryan of killing her, although they know their marriage had some problems. In October 2020, an anonymous donor added $40,000 to the reward fund, bringing the total reward to $50,000. Melissa's loved ones were hopeful that the increased reward would bring in some new leads for detectives to investigate. A few more tips were received, but none led police to a suspect. Detectives have not said whether they think the gunshot came from another car or a person standing on the side of the road, but they have said they believe Melissa was the intended target. Her family continues to search for answers and remains hopeful that someone will come forward with the information needed to obtain justice for Melissa. Still, as of June 2023, Melissa's case remains unsolved. Courtney Deborah Heater was born on May 22, 1995, and raised in Plainfield, Illinois. She loved playing rugby, cheerleading, Irish dancing, hockey, and being adventurous. In 2018, Courtney met Julian Juan Phipps online 
and moved to Nakina, North Carolina to live with him and attend nursing school. However, after arriving, Courtney found the situation wasn't quite what she was expecting. He told her not to bring her car, and this forced her to stay at home instead of attending school or work. She was also expected to care for one son while he was away. On top of that, there was often no power to the home, and she had very poor cell phone service. It didn't take her long to regret her decision. Plus, she had no idea before she moved that Juan allegedly struggled with drug addiction. In September 2019, Courtney and Juan got into a disagreement that turned physical. According to the medical report, Courtney suffered a facial laceration and contusion, a mild concussion, and a laceration repair. This was only one of the many disagreements the couple would have. In November 2019, Courtney confided to her mom, Debbie Heater, that she wanted to leave the relationship. She sent her mom photos of herself with a black eye and blood on her face. Shockingly, on February 2, 2020, Debbie received a phone call from the coroner's office in Columbus County, North Carolina. The coroner informed her mother that Courtney had died at 4 a.m. that morning in her home with her boyfriend present. According to the 911 call on the day of her death, the dispatcher asked Juan numerous times if any drugs were involved, but he responds saying no, she never did drugs. Her loved ones also denied her having any drug use. However, a toxicology report would find that she died from fentanyl and heroin intoxication. If she didn't use drugs, how did they get into her system? She also suffered from fluid in her lungs and blunt force injuries to her head, chest, abdomen, pelvis, and extremities. Courtney's autopsy had multiple pages describing marks, bruises, gashes, and broken bones. Unfortunately, even with signs of physical abuse, the police department closed the case, ruling it an accidental overdose. According to her mother, she has repeatedly tried to call the Columbus County Sheriff's Office, but they have failed to return her calls. Text messages and voice memos between the couple were found, showing that Courtney was trying to get one to stop using drugs. It was generally those pleas that caused his explosive outburst of anger toward her, generally resulting in physical and mental abuse. Her family feels there was never a proper investigation, and they don't understand why they never got a statement from Juan about the incident. In January of 2023, Juan was allegedly murdered by Xavier Thomas and suffered some of the same injuries as Courtney. As of June 2023, the case remains closed, but her family continues to search for answers. Christopher James Hoye dreamed of owning his own property and wanted to build a family just like the religious one he grew up in. By May of 2022, 33-year-old Chris was living in Dixon, Missouri with his wife Alicia and their blended family. They had relocated there after Chris was unhappy with how COVID was handled in Illinois. He hated that his businesses were shut down, so the family made the tough decision to move and create a more sustainable life together. On May 19, 2022, things were going like any typical day on the farm, with animals to tend to and the kids outside running around. His son Alex accidentally broke their duck eggs that were in incubation, so he cleaned the mess up because he knew Alicia would be too sad to do it. There was also a tornado warning, and he and Alicia worked for a few hours on the home to avoid another flooding disaster. Afterward, the couple sat on the porch discussing their plans to fix up the new property. After they were done talking, Chris went and took a shower. At 6.30 p.m., Alicia told Chris that she was heading to milk the goats. Strangely, about three minutes later, she heard his truck start up and leave. She entered the home and asked their young son where his father went, to which he replied, I don't know, he told me to go to my room. She looked outside and saw that Chris's truck was gone, the gate was left open, and Chris's wallet and phone were left at the house. Two hours later, a friend of Alicia's came over to watch the kids so she could go look for him. She had become increasingly concerned, 
because it was very out of character for Chris to leave without saying I love you, and he had never left without closing the gate. Hoping that he had just left for a quick errand, Alicia waited, but Chris never returned. She decided to check the nearby river where they went swimming at times, and that's where she found his truck abandoned, with the keys inside by the Veterans Bridge off Highway 28. Nighttime was fast approaching, so Alicia used her phone flashlight to look around his truck but saw no sign of him, not even footprints. She repeatedly yelled his name to no avail, and with no other options, she called the police. Deputies searched the water and woods, but no trace of Chris was found. The search continued with multiple agencies and volunteers and occurred the day after he went missing and 10 days later as well. The police searched with drones, with cameras, dogs, and upwards of 50 volunteers. Family and friends have also organized search parties, handing out flyers, and scouring the nearby woods and trails. Despite the massive search effort, there has yet to be any sign of Chris. Some believe foul play is involved, while others speculate that he took his own life. His wife, Alicia, said although he was depressed around the time of his disappearance, she doesn't believe he would have harmed himself. Instead, he could have left because he thought he was disappointing his family because of his depression. She stated that she believes with all her heart that he is alive and out there running from himself. As of 2023, there have been at least two unconfirmed sightings of Chris in Lebanon, Missouri. He had custody of his two children from a previous marriage, and after his disappearance, they were returned to their mother's care. This has been very upsetting to their stepmom, Alicia, who was fighting to gain custody of them. As of June 2023, Chris remains missing, and this case remains unsolved. Samantha Leanne Tapp was born on July 20, 1988. At the age of 16, she was living in Burleson, Texas, and went by Sam. She was described as a funny girl that loved the outdoors and making other people laugh. She and her older sister, Kendale, came from a difficult family situation and spent time in foster care as children. When their foster mother could no longer care for them, the girls split up to stay with different relatives, with Sam going to live with her aunt and Kendale with their grandparents. Eventually, Sam would join Kendale at their grandparents' home in Burleson. However, by 2004, Kendale had moved into her own place, and Sam would remain with her grandparents. Sam was known to often walk to her family and friends' homes because she didn't own a car. On October 12, 2004, Sam left her grandparents' home around 7.30 p.m. and began walking to her sister Kendale's house, which was only a few blocks away. 30 minutes later, Sam arrived at her sister's and asked if she could stay the night with her. She was upset and seemed afraid of getting in trouble if she returned to her grandparents' house, but she didn't elaborate any further. At the time, Sam was on probation for using her grandmother's car without permission, leading to the car being reported as stolen. Kendale told Sam she couldn't stay and needed to return home. Kendale had no way of knowing this would be the last time she would see her sister. Sam was upset and left on foot. After leaving, no one could get in touch with her, and they assumed she was staying at a friend's house. Once Kendale realized something was seriously wrong, she attempted to report her sister missing to the local Burleson Police Department. But because there was no signs of foul play, she was listed as voluntarily missing and considered an endangered runaway. There was little to no effort by authorities to locate Sam, even after rearranged backyard furniture at her grandparents' house had been found a few days after she went missing. All law enforcement did was advise the grandparents to change their locks. Over six years later, on February 17, 2011, the name Sam Tapp was run by St. Helena Police in Columbia County, Oregon. However, there is no information for why the records were run due to the amount of time that had passed. Sam had an aunt living in the area at the time, but the aunt told investigators that she hadn't seen Sam. Over eight years later, on the night of June 20, 2013, the name Sam Tapp was run by U.S. Customs and Border Protection at the Dallas-Fort Worth International Airport, which is the nearest airport to where she lived. 
Once again, there was no record of why her name was run, nor confirmation of whether this was actually the Sam in question. Investigators theorize that someone may have been trying to use her identity. In 2015, a new investigation into Sam's disappearance began when the Burleson Police Department contacted the Texas Attorney General and requested that their Fugitive Apprehension Unit become involved. Sam was classified as a fugitive because she was on probation at the time of her disappearance, but nothing came of that either. Kendall has been trying to convince authorities to change Sam's case classification from endangered runaway to missing person to garner more attention. If Sam is still alive, she would be 33 years old today. In 2021, with help from private investigator Lou Barry and family advocate Jason Watts, Kendall filed a Freedom of Information Act request for records. The Attorney General's office granted the request for documentation, but not the Burleson Police Department. Information from the Attorney General's office shows that Sam's name had been run multiple times in several states. In addition to the Dallas-Fort Worth Airport and Oregon instances, her name also appeared in Melbourne, Florida, Minnesota, and possibly Wisconsin. It was also discovered that she made contact with an aunt or uncle in Texas with whom she asked to live with. Sam later called the relative, saying she had met a man and was moving with him to Melbourne, Florida. Kendall likes to think Sam wanted to escape from a traumatic childhood and start a new life. If she could talk to Sam today, she would want Sam to know that she's not in any trouble. There are people who love her, and she doesn't have to be afraid to come home if she's in a position to do that. And if she's not free to make contact or is in a bad situation, Kendall says she would tell Sam, hang in there, I'll find you eventually. There's a possibility that Sam is using an alias, such as Samantha Vandiver, which is the last name of her foster mother, or Samantha Brown, the name of one of her relatives. After nearly 19 years, she is still classified as an endangered runaway. Her family is also not ruling out the possibility that she met with foul play, and as of June 2023, she has never been found, and this case remains unsolved.